All right, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to our, our latest edition of the Apex Office Hours. My name is Mark Seifts. I'm Senior Director of Software Development for Oracle Apex. And today we're going to talk about uh, Apex 24.1. I'm sure you've all heard uh, that we've released Apex 24.1 earlier uh, this week. Uh, we had a big launch event on Monday uh, where Mike Hitchfa and Andy Mendelssohn introduced uh, Apex 24.1 and the new AI capabilities that we're introducing uh, with this release. Uh, if you missed the event, uh, I'm going to share a link to YouTube here uh, uh, shortly. And yeah, today we're going to talk about uh, 24.1. This is part one of a four-part series. I'll show you the schedule here in a moment. And today we're going to be focusing on uh, a general overview of what's new in 24.1 and then go into uh, details on all our new AI features. I'm having uh, Christina Cho, Stefan Dobre, and Ralph Müller here with me today. We're going to do the AI uh, demos for you. All right, so Apex 24.1 uh, was released on Monday of this week, June 17th. Uh, there's a link to the launch event uh, video and uh, the blog post uh, that talks about the details. There's also a QR code if you just want to hop right there. And uh, unlike past releases, uh, we launched everything on that day. So apex.orca.com was upgraded. Uh, Apex, uh, Apex 24.1 for on-premise installation has been made available for download from OTN. And we also uh, started the OCI Air upgrades. So on Oracle Cloud, uh, over the next couple of uh, days, you'll get uh, Apex 24.1 to be available in all regions. Uh, we're going to have four Apex office hours, or five, uh, on 24.1. Uh, the first one today covering a general overview and our new AI features. The next week, we're going to have uh, an office hours covering vector search and some of our new component types, select one and select many, improvements to working copies. We're also going to have the Spanish Apex office hours on 24.1. Then uh, we take a break on July 4th, which is a holiday here in the US. And then on July 11th, uh, we're going to do uh, the next part uh, three talking about workflow and approval enhancements, component groups and builder extensions. And then the last one is on July 25th, where we're gonna talk about the new PDF printing capabilities, uh, date picker support uh, and changes to REST data sources. All right, if you miss any of the Apex office hours, you can always come back and uh, look at the recordings. You can also subscribe uh, to the office hours that you hear about what's coming up. And uh, go to apexorg.com, go playlist uh, to look at our past Apex office hours. This goes back a couple of years. So if you want, have missed any of those, you can always watch the recordings. Uh, then I want to highlight uh, our uh, learning paths, uh, apexorg.com, go AI learn. We have a new learning path on AI in Oracle. So scan the code or go to this URL, and uh, I'm sure we'll share it in uh, chat and the queue as well. Uh, this is the uh, learning path for AI in Oracle Apex. Then I would like to uh, highlight our upcoming Apex conference at ODTAC K-Scope 24. Uh, that's coming up uh, in July, in a couple of weeks, July 14th till 18th. Uh, this uh, uh, K-Scope is going to be in Nashville this year, and we have a number of uh, large number of uh, Apex team members uh, presenting there. Uh, so please uh, join us, uh, talk to us, uh, ask your questions, give your feedback. Uh, we're going to have an Apex Symposium again on the first day, on Sunday. We're going to introduce all the new features in 24.1. We're also going to have a three-day bootcamp uh, for beginners starting with Apex. And then we have a whole bunch of sessions during the week uh, where our team members as well as speakers from around the world uh, will talk about uh, Apex. And then uh, later in uh, September, early September, there's going to be Oracle Cloud World in Las Vegas. We're also going to have a number of Apex uh, presentations and hands-on labs and, of course, demo grounds at uh, Cloud World this year. All right, let's talk about Apex 24.1. Uh, again, I uh, hope you've seen the announcement video on Monday. We also have a blog post that talks about many of the high-level features. Uh, those are the three main pillars of this release. Uh, AI, of course, is uh, front and center. Uh, our AI assistant, uh, Create application wizard uh, with AI capabilities and using AI in your own applications. Uh, then earlier in May, uh, then database 23 AI came out. And of course, Apex being part of the Oracle database, you can take uh, advantage of all the features that the Oracle database provides you with. 
including AI vector search, which we'll talk more about uh, in our next office hours. Uh, native server-side JavaScript. Uh, we just recently had a office hours on server-side JavaScript MLE uh, that is available with 23AI and uh, Apex. Uh, it's about a month ago, so you can go to the recordings and uh, watch that one. And then 23AI database also introduces JSON uh, uh, relational duality views. And then, of course, in Apex, we do have a lot more features than just AI. There are a number of new uh, components, uh, enhancements to the workflow engines, uh, enhancements to our working copy feature, which we introduced in 23.2, and uh, the new printing engine uh, doing, allowing you to create pixel-perfect reports. So there's uh, when you go to apexauto.com, uh, you'll find our new features page, or this is uh, the direct link there that lists all the new features in uh, detail. I kind of grouped it here into uh, six pieces uh, that I would like to give you a very high-level overview of. I'm not going to go into much detail. I want to leave enough time for the AI features and demos, of course. But uh, the six main areas where we uh, made improvements, enhancements, new features are, of course, AI. We've added a number of new updated components. Uh, we made enhancements to workflow and uh, approvals and enhancements to developer experience, user experience, and uh, then uh, everything else. So let's take a quick look at it. Uh, AI, we'll talk more uh, about in a moment. But just in general, uh, AI is not built into Apex as such. There's no AI engine. Uh, what we built into Apex are a number of AI features. You configure an AI, uh, and then you can take advantage of these AI capabilities in uh, your application development uh, in the builder. Uh, you can use, uh, you can build applications using AI. Uh, you can use natural language to create uh, SQL statements in our wizards and code editors. And you can uh, use AI to help you debug and analyze your uh, code. And you can also build AI into your own applications. Uh, you can create AI widgets, AI, AI dialogues uh, in your applications, have the AI return uh, information into your application. And you can also use a, uh, Apex AI PL SQL APIs to uh, make your own callouts to AI. And more on that in a moment. But first, uh, some of the other announcements in 24.1. Uh, there are a number of new components in Apex and updated components. There's a new select one and select many item type. Uh, there are more, uh, there are more flexible template components. Uh, we now have uh, selection support and uh, read-only template components if you don't want to have a data source, if you just want to have a temp template components for some kind of content. Uh, there's also some improvements uh, to performance of uh, template components. Then we've updated uh, our support for REST and uh, JSON. You can now have hierarchical uh, JSON structures. Uh, both JSON comes with arrays and, and things like that. So it's easier to work with hierarchical JSON now. Uh, we've enhanced uh, our workflow component and approval component. Uh, workflows were introduced in Apex 2302. In this release, we now allow you to have a view, a diagram of your workflow, something like you're seeing here in your own applications. So uh, in 23.2, you were able to go to the workflow designer to design your workflows. Now you can actually show the workflow and the progress in your own applications. Developer experience, uh, we now have uh, component groups as a new shared component. A lot of our larger customers and internal teams that we are working with, they're building large applications with Apex that are comprised of a number of smaller modules or smaller applications. And it's good practice to have a master application that has a number of uh, things defined centrally, like authentication schemes, templates, themes, uh, lists, uh, navigation lists, and such uh, in one central application. And then you subscribe to this master application from all your different uh, modules. And with uh, 24.1, you can now put all these shared components into a component group, and then much more easily subscribe them and publish them across all your different apps. Working copies were introduced in Apex 23.02. Uh, they allow you to create a copy of your application to make changes work on these changes, uh, and then once you're done with your changes, uh, diff them, compare them to your master, to your main app, and then uh, merge them back in. And we further enhance that uh, in 24.1. Uh, you can now more easily compare, uh, for example, page changes directly from within Page Designer. You can also uh, get uh, information on uh, whether pages have changed in other copies. 
And if you happen to open up your main uh, application, then you'll be notified that this is the main and that you may want to change your working copy. Uh, we've introduced a new document generation uh, function service on OCI that allows you to create your own report layouts uh, using Word, upload them uh, into object storage, and then use this function service to create a pixel perfect uh, PDF documents. And we've integrated it with that now in 24.1, Apex 24.1 that is. Uh, you can uh, upload report layouts using MS Word uh, into your Apex, Apex application and then uh, use that for your classic reports and interactive reports and our print APIs to print uh, pixel perfect uh, reports with uh, Apex. We've also enhanced our build extensions feature. Build extensions previously allowed you to go into a central workspace and uh, essentially define some bookmarks there that would allow uh, would show up across all your subscribing workspaces. Now with 24.1, uh, you can actually build applications in this uh, uh, extensions workspace and make these applications available throughout all your uh, subscribing workspaces. So if you have, for example, an application that uh, analyzes your application metadata, scans your code, you can now uh, deploy that centrally and make that available to everybody else on your Apex instance. Uh, then we have, <coughs> excuse me, number of general uh, builder improvements, enhancements to uh, Spotlight, enhancements to REST data sources. You can now more easily just export a single page uh, in our readable uh, format. Uh, and there have been some general enhancements to uh, Page Designer. Uh, user experience, uh, there's uh, updates to the universal theme, to Redford Lite. Uh, there's a new Font Apex 2.3. And we've also made a number of accessibility improvements. Uh, they are now read-only items that are much more accessible than they used to be. And uh, we've added a number of additional help texts uh, to relevant uh, places in Apex. And then I think once one feature that a lot of you ask about, out of the mis dismissing of success messages, if you have a success message show up in your application, so they now can be configured to automatically uh, disappear. And then some other uh, additional enhancements and uh, updates. I'm going to go through all of them, just a few highlights. Uh, there's a declarative way now to download uh, your BLOPs and CLOPs. Uh, there's better button processing, avoiding duplic duplicate uh, page submissions, enhancements to Oracle text. Uh, there's also a new API that allows you to uh, get database dependencies. That API tells you all the objects, tables, views, uh, PLC packages referenced by your application. If you're running Apex on ADB, uh, you can take advantage of server-side uh, geocoding. Uh, and of course, as always, the updates to our PLSQL APIs and uh, JavaScript library upgrades. With each release of Apex, we ship a number of open source libraries uh, uh, that are used for our rich text editors, uh, calendars, and such. And with each release of Apex, uh, we upgrade uh, these libraries. All right, that was the general overview and a lot more of uh, what's new in Apex uh, 241. You can see it during our upcoming Apex office hours and of course on apexoracle.com. There's also gonna be uh, lots of videos and uh, blog, po blog posts being uh, published. Now let's talk about AI. Uh, with Apex 24.1, uh, we introduce a number of AI uh, features uh, to Apex. Uh, you can take advantage of these uh, features uh, on-premise, on the cloud, uh, so you basically go in and you configure your AI uh, to be used uh, in workspace. And uh, if you're running uh, Apex uh, on the cloud, uh, there are a number of uh, cloud services that are available on OCI, and you can configure those uh, with Apex. Uh, you can also configure third-party AI services like OpenAI and Cohere with Apex. And there's more support and more services, OCI services coming uh, soon. Uh, the features that we've introduced are uh, for developers. Uh, so as you develop your applications, you can make use of these AI features as well as uh, use AI in your own applications and make AI available to your end users. Uh, at a high level, uh, the architecture kind of looks a little bit like this. Uh, we have the Oracle database. And in the Oracle database, as we always had, we have the Apex schema which is now the Apex 24.1 uh, schema, which has all your application metadata, and that includes uh, the web credentials and the configuration of your AI service. It also includes the Apex dictionary cache, and the Apex dictionary cache includes information about your own objects. 
So in addition to the Apex schema, there's also the user schema, uh, which includes your own uh, tables, employees, departments, warehouses, and such. And again, the Stage Dictionary cache uh, includes additional information on these tables, things like uh, friendly table names, column names, foreign key relationships, primary keys, and everything that might be relevant uh, for the AI uh, to return uh, results uh, that are useful. Now you configure this uh, on the workspace uh, level or on the instance level, uh, and you can configure multiple AIs, and you can configure one AI to be used for your builder. So there's one AI that can be enabled to do things like the create up wizard and the natural language to SQL. And then you can use the same AI or different AI for your own applications. So you ask a question to the AI assistant, for example, show me the average salary of employees in each department. And you get a query back like select department name, average salary from employees. You'll see a lot more about that in our demos coming up shortly. Uh, configuration, uh, you go to your workspace uh, utilities, uh, and then you can pick uh, the uh, AI that you want to configure. Uh, it works very much like our REST data sources. So they are web credentials where you store your keys and your, your uh, authentication information. And then you configure your AI service using the name and static ID, uh, reference to the credentials, uh, which AI model you want to use and some additional settings and whether you would like to use this AI for the builder. And at a very high level, uh, you have AI capabilities for application development. So when you're creating application, you can use uh, the natural language, uh, uh, you can use natural language to create uh, your application. You can also use uh, AI to create SQL, natural language to SQL, which is available in our create page wizards, create report wizards, as well as in uh, code editors in uh, Page Designer, uh, also available in uh, SQL commands. And then there's AI assisted debugging. Uh, so if you have some typos in there or need some help with your SQL, you can uh, ask the AI to help uh, look at your SQL or write the SQL for you. And then for your end user applications, for your own application that you're building with Apex, you can also include an AI widget or conversational AI dialogue uh, that you can configure with a prompt that is relevant to the application that you're building. And then you're getting uh, information back from the AI, which you can then use in your application. And there's also an Apex AI API available for you uh, to uh, build your own uh, programmatic uh, AI integration. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to the demos. All right. Thank you, Mark. Um, there's a lot to cover, so I'm just going to jump straight into it. How do I connect my Apex environment to such an external uh, AI provider. And that's very important. It is external. You will need an internet connection um, to let Apex communicate to that uh, AI service. Um, other than that, there's no other uh, restrictions. It will work on all of, all of the supported database versions. Um, it is not a 23 AI thing only. So. First things first, you go to one of the three AI providers that Mark mentioned earlier. Uh, you play a bit in the in the uh, playgrounds that they offer. Perhaps you create an account. Perhaps you um, top it up with some credits. Um, after that, you will want to generate an API key from that service. That's very important. Once you have that API key, you're ready to go. You come here into Apex. And you're going to want to create a workspace, uh, a new workspace utility that we've introduced. So this link between Apex and, uh, and the AI uh, provider is not an application setting. It's not an application shared component. It's something more global at workspace level. We go into workspace utilities. And you're going to see this new entry here, Generative AI. We click here, and this is where we can create multiple such links to various um, AI providers for whatever use case. Perhaps in our applications, we have very specific uh, um, uh, use cases, and we have different uh, providers and different models that we use uh, for these use cases. But in my case, I'll just create one from scratch that I'm going to use for everything. So I'll go ahead and click Create. I'm going to select some provider that I have an API key for. Um, you're going to want to give this uh, service a name, something like 
my main AI provider. Uh, the static ID is helpful if you're gonna refer to this AI service in your PL SQL code. So if you want to programmatically um, communicate with the AI, so something like my main AI provider. I'm gonna skip over these settings. Um, really, the most important thing is pasting your API key in here. You're gonna want to do that. You're gonna want to click create and you're done. You have this new kind of workspace uh, object that you can then uh, tie uh, to an application. What I do want to say is that under the hood, we've created two things just now. We've created a web credential automatically that contains that API key. You don't see it here, but uh, uh, it is populated and this uh, generative AI service. So there's two building blocks, let's say. Um, other than that, you will see here that we're referencing that credential. Other than that, you have a couple of more advanced options such as the AI model. Um, and we're trying to default uh, these things to something uh, sensible, but everything moves so fast in the AI world that um, you're probably gonna wanna replace this with something more uh, um, modern. Um, Besides that, HTTP headers, this, these are more advanced things um, and some uh, comments just for developers. That's it really. Now, as I was saying, I can have as many of those um, services as I want, but if I want the Apex Builder to be able to leverage and piggyback off of one as well, I have to tell Apex which one that is. So in my case, I will say that this particular service is also going to be used by the app builder to um, use for its various uh, AI functionalities. And as Mark was saying, um, you can only mark one AI uh, service as used by app builder. Right. Uh, one more kind of technical aspect before we get into the actual uh, exciting demos. Um, that I want to mention are the technical details around uh, uh, deploying or exporting your, uh, your application. Um, and I'll show you later how you can tie such an AI service to a particular application. And then you're gonna see that when you export said application in the export file, you're going to have uh, also the, um, the definition of this AI service and of the web credential. So everything will be bundled and ready to go in one export file. There's two caveats here that I want to mention. One, when we export uh, a web credential, we will never export the API key as well. So if you move your application to some dev environment into the prod environment, you're going to want to pass along that API key as well. And you can do that in two ways. One, manually enter it. So on your prod system, if you happen to have uh, um, um, access to the Apex Builder, you can just uh, edit the web credential and paste it in, or you can script this action. Uh, for that, we, as always, have the um, Apex credential uh, PL SQL package, and you might want to use something like set persistent credentials. So you can really script uh, the deployment of your application like this. Second caveat, um, if your um, prod environment is completely empty, it does not contain even an older version of this AI service, everything will get installed uh, properly. But if on your other system, a, a generative AI service by uh, this static ID already exists, we will not be overriding it. And that's important to know because you might want to update uh, let's say the AI model and ship that change over to your other system, um, that will uh, not happen. So again, you need to script uh, changes to already existing um, uh, generative AI uh, services. And to do that, we have extended the Apex application install package, specifically the set remote server procedure with a couple of new AI specific parameters. So that's how you can script um, patching or updating existing 
uh, generative AI services on other systems. But in short, uh, that was it. Select your provider, paste in your API key, and you are ready to go. Uh, next up, I want to hand it over to my colleague Christina to demo um, how this actually uh, works in the app builder. Thank you, Stefan. All right. So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Christina Cho from Apex Development Team. I'm here to show you today how you can use generative AI within Apex to uh, use your natural language to design a new application and enhance your application. As Stefan quickly went over, um, if you have generative AI service configured within uh, your Apex 24.1 environment with used by a builder attribute enabled, you can uh, use Apex AI Assistant throughout App Builder as well as SQL Workshop. So let's explore how you can use natural language to create a new application. Um, notice that in the create app page option, you can click to create an uh, app using the generative AI. So let's click that option. In order to use this feature, you first need to accept the terms and conditions first. Uh, it's because uh, Apex behind the scenes sends information about your tables and columns in order to help AI compose your application blueprint. So let's accept that. And now I'm able to put in my description here in the prompt in conversational way. Uh, notice that I have two buttons on the bottom in my prompt where I can click on it to test out with an example prompt. So if you come in here and have no idea what to do to describe about your application, uh, try clicking in one of these buttons. And if you don't see these buttons, uh, when you open up the uh, Apex AI Assistant, the way to display them is go to SQL Workshop and go to sample data sets and install any of these samples. So, uh, like me, I installed Inven Dev and Projects data here. And that's how I was able to test out uh, using the example prompts. If you don't know what tables to use, uh, there's no worry. You can ask AI what tables to use. So let's ask AI. Looks like AI understood my question and it gave me the list of tables. Uh, that is related with the projects. Um, so I'm going to give a little more detailed description about my uh, app. Um, I'm going to ask AI to include specific page types such as dashboard and report, calendar and facet search using the tables that um, I want. And notice that I'm not spelling out exact table names here. As long as you give the friendly table name to AI, AI knows what to use for that specific page types. So let's see if AI can come up with my blueprint that I can use to start, uh, start designing my application. Okay, so AI gave me a blueprint here uh, with suggested application name and with suggested page names, um, but I'm going to reorder some of the pages. Let's move uh, dashboard page. Let's move around some of these pages as I'd like to order them in specific way. And let's see if AI can do this for me. Looks like it understood and moved around the pages exactly the way I want. Uh, there seems to be some features that I can enable here. Um, it uh, enabled PWM and push notifications for me, but I'm gonna ask AI what are additional features that I can enable. AI gave me an answer that these are the additional features I can enable. So I'm going to enable uh, access control as well as monitor, uh, activity monitor feature. All right, so I think I, I am good with this blueprint that AI gave it to me to jumpstart creating uh, my project management dashboard app. 
So in order to create it, all you need to do is click on create application button. Now you're navigated into create application wizard. You can confirm all of these selections that AI made for me through the blueprint, or you can refine it further by adding additional pages here. Let's check quickly if AI picked up a correct table. Uh, this is not the table I wanted. I wanted a projects table. So you can correct some things that AI didn't come up correctly. Uh, so let's display some uh, uh, status ID uh, in the uh, uh, chart, in the pie chart, and let's save this up. All right, let's click to create the application. Okay, let's run the application to verify and let's sign in. Notice that the uh, dashboard was included for me and I can quickly overview project counts based on the status here. Um, let's see uh, if report and form page was included. I can manage my projects uh, by uh, using this uh, report and form page. Uh, let's see, milestones can be managed through the calendar and I can also browse through uh, and filter down using the facets to view specific projects. If you go to admin page, uh, admin page also included additional features that I asked AI to include, which is the activity reports and access control. Let's view uh, this page, which I asked AI to include, which is the blank page. Uh, so let's start enhancing this page by adding some additional regions. Let's add a region. Uh, let's name this as project summary. And let's choose uh, one of the uh, template component region type with a SQL query source. Let's expand this editor. Notice that Apex AI Assistant icon displays. You can enable this to ask AI in writing a query. If you are in SQL code editor mode, uh, there are two different modes. Default is the query builder mode. Um, this is the mode where you can ask AI help writing a SQL query. Apex behind the scene, again, sends information about your table, column, primary key, and foreign key relationships. So AI can help you compose a SQL query. There is another mode uh, in SQL Code Editor, which is the general assistant mode. And I'll show you what that mode is a little, uh, a little later on in the demo. Let's take the default mode and ask AI a um, question about showing the summary of the projects by the status. Well, AI gave me a query to run. I didn't have to remember all the column names and table names. All I used is the natural language in conversational way to get that query. Let's check if it came back with the valid uh, table and columns. Looks like it did. So I'm gonna close out from this uh, editor because I need to use this source, but I need to select some of the required attributes for this uh, region. So let's display status uh, as a title, uh, display avatar, and let's change this uh, icon to be a little different and show the total projects um, in the value using the project count. Let's run this. Now I have a summary region, which I used using the query that AI gave it to me. Uh, I can quickly uh, browse through how many projects has been completed using this summary region here. Let's expand a little bit. Let's add additional region and let's call this as project detail. And let's use, uh, let's see, let's use one of the uh, report region type with SQL query source again. And let's enable Apex AI Assistant. This time, let's ask a little more information to AI to show all the projects with assignee, budget, status, milestone, and comments. Let's see what AI gives me back. 
or AI gave me uh, more information, more column information. Um, I didn't have to know about the table names or column names. But what's amazing is uh, to, in order to select all of these information, um, it understood the relationships between these tables, about five different tables. So it automatically joined all these information for me. Let's see if this is a valid query. It looks like it's, it is valid. Um, so instead of closing out from my editor, I'm gonna quickly test this out by clicking on save and run. Okay, my uh, report region displays. Uh, it, it's a bit too much, but it displayed all the information that I requested to AI using the query that AI gave it to me. Let's enhance this query a little bit. Let's add additional column here. I'd like to uh, display task count for each of the projects additionally. Let's see what AI does. So AI gave me a query, so let's insert this. Uh, looks like it included that additional column for me by joining in another uh, table. So let's do validate and let's run this. Okay, the column is not there, but I can see that it is available. So let's put it into a display list and I can quickly go over how many tasks are there for each of these projects using that column. All right. Um, let's edit this query further. Uh, this time, instead of getting a help from AI, let's edit this on my own. So let's add an order by clause and order by the project name. And let's do a validation. Looks like I introduced the syntax error here, but with along with the error that uh, Apex gave me, there is a little link where I can click on it to get a help from AI um, to figure out what's wrong with this and help me fixing this query. When you click on it, now I'm not in a query builder mode. It changes into general assistant mode because this is a general uh, SQL syntax uh, improvement that I need to make. So Apex sends that information behind the scene for me. Uh, AI gave the explanation why it failed, and it also gave me corrected SQL query. So I'm going to replace this query with the corrected one that AI gave it to me. Let's do a validation. My query is fixed. I don't have to do anything uh, nor think about it. It is fixed. And what I did wrong was order by clause was put in before the group by clause. And that's why it failed. But AI fixed up this for me. So let's do save and run to make sure that uh, page runs without an error. All right. So page is fine. Let's try different things. Let's close out from SQL Code Editor. Uh, let's add a button here and call show message. And let's see, let's put it, all right, let's put it into a create slot with make it as hot. And let's add a dynamic action here. So instead of showing something, let's choose to include a JavaScript code. Notice within the context of the JavaScript code, I can also enable Apex AI Assistant. There is no query builder mode anymore because I'm not in SQL Code Editor. Uh, SQL Code Editor is the only one that allows you to use the query builder mode. So let's get on help from AI because um, I want to write something, but I have no idea how to write a JavaScript function. So let's ask AI how to show success message saying build this page with on help from AI. AI came back with an example to use. Uh, looks like this seems to be an Apex JavaScript API I can use with a message. So let's save and run and try if this works. Okay, so let's test out the functionality by clicking on the button. I have a success message that's displays within the page uh, uh, by getting on help from AI. All right, let's go into a uh, different mode here. Uh, if you go to uh, page uh, inline CSS, again, code editor, I can enable Apex AI Assistant, but before I get on help on CSS, let's inspect this page. 
And I know within the universal theme, there are different uh, CSS variables that I can use to change the color. One is the header color. So I'm going to copy that CSS variable and ask um, how to change this. OK, let's see what AI comes back. Well, AI understood my prompt. I didn't know anything about CSS syntax, but it gave me an example to use. So I'm going to use that. And since I have the blue header color already, I'm going to change it into a little different color. I like the hot pink color here. So let's save and run and try this. All right, so my page is changed. I can uh, go into different page here, but this is the only page that has that uh, different color because I was using the inline CSS that AI gave an answer for. All right, so these are the quick overview of how you can utilize Apex AI Assistant throughout the builder to get on help how to you by using natural language to jumpstart creating a new application get on help on writing a SQL queries, JavaScript, CSS. If you're in a static region, if you need help with HTML, you can do that as well. Um, App Builder is not the only place where Apex AI Assistant is available. Anywhere code editor is available within Apex, you can enable Apex Assistant, such as SQL commands, to get a help from AI in designing your application. So. Try out this new functionality and explore the possibilities. Um, thank you so much. And I'm now going to hand it over back to Stefan. So for the second part of the demo, we're going to be looking at using these AI capabilities in end user apps. So not on the developer side, but the, on the end user side. So let's see what we're starting. Um, work with here i just have a a little application that i use to draft some blog posts um and let's say i would like to have that same or similar sort of assistant um in a chat like uh, um, uh, ui that uh, christina was showing but for whatever purpose uh i have here on this page perhaps i want some help um coming up with this blog post. So in Apex 24.1, we have really focused on delivering uh, two things because AI can come in so many different uh, forms. One is the visual chat experience. Um, and two is the programmatic PL SQL APIs. And I'm going to demo uh, both of these things and how they can help me um, deliver this uh, blog post here. First things first, I'm going to want to go to my application definition and I'm going to see here a new entry for AI. On this page, I can select a default service that all of my different components that use AI are going to use. So I don't have to configure them individually. And that's also a nice way of tying an application uh, to an AI service so that they get, as I was saying, exported uh, together. So I only have one. I select this one. The consent message is also a very cool functionality, but we don't have uh, time to get into that right now. So now I tied the two together. Let's edit page three. And what we want to do is just have a button that uh, opens up that chat interface. Let's create a button, call it AI help. Um, let's change its position. Let us give it a more uh, funky look, an icon. And notice we also have uh, new AI related icons. So I'm going to use this FA robot icon. And I'm going to run my page and there it is. So. On button click, I want that uh, AI pop-up. And that is as simple as 
creating a dynamic action. I'm going to call this one on AI help click with one true action using this new open AI assistant action. And really, I don't have to set anything else. It's just going to work. I can optionally select a different service than my default one. But in this case, I will just leave, um, leave it as is. So on button click, I have my pop up, I can say, hello. And it works. Now, we're just going to play around with this widget for a bit. And then um, in a few minutes, we're actually going to make it do something useful for us. So let's see if it actually works or if this is some dummy message. Say hello to the Oracle Apex office hours crowd. They, they're very excited to meet you. Be enthu enthusiastic and use emojis. Let's see if that works. All right, the AI is saying hello to all of us. That is good, it works, right? And there was really very little to configure. Um, let's see what, um, actually before we jump into these settings, let me just make a few points about kind of the, um, the way this widget is, is built. As you've seen, uh, it's a very structured conversation. It's really one message from one side uh, another message from the other. You cannot really send subsequent messages. Um, and while the AI is thinking, and for longer tasks, it might take uh, longer to think, um, you can start typing another follow-up message, uh, but you will have to wait for it to fully respond before you can send that message. So it's very structured uh, like that. Um, another point I'd like to make about the nature of this conversation is that it is uh, designed to be more short-lived. So really, we want to get in here, ask our question, get a response, and hop back out. Um, so you'll notice if I close this assistant and open it again, the history is lost. Um, and it is really uh, designed that way. We want to make this a productive uh, um, assistant and not have very open-ended uh, conversations. Um, so we don't store the uh, we don't store the conversation in the apex backend your ai provider um, doesn't store it um, yeah it's really short-lived also note that whenever we send a new message and we get a response and we send another message and so on for each of these uh, round trips we have to send the whole conversation to the ai provider because we don't have that um, that session or context kept anywhere. Um, for this reason, and as conversations get very large, um, it might get a bit expensive in terms of the tokens that you're consuming. So it is recommended to uh, try to keep your, um, your conversations very uh, on point and um, again, short lived and quick uh, to save up on, on the token usage as well. So that was a bit about the widget itself. Let's see what other options we have here. Uh, let's take a few moments to discuss the system prompt. And that is a very important of this um, architecture. The system prompt is where we tell the AI how to behave, right? What it's, what it's good at, what it uh, should answer to, how it should answer, what it shouldn't answer to, and so on. So really to have a tailored experience for your specific use case, you're going to want to populate something in the system prompt. By default, if you don't say anything, uh, it's going to default to something like you are a helpful assistant and it's very general purpose. Um, but let me play with it a little bit and say something like you only speak Spanish. You do not speak any other languages. Let's see what happens now. I can say something like, hello there. Oh boy, okay, I do not understand this. Speak English, please. 
no can do, right? So it really tries to respect as much as possible what you have uh, instructed it to do. And that's how you can create these tailored assistants. Um, another use for this system prompt is perhaps you want to give it some more context or knowledge. Um, I've seen an example recently, say you're running a clinic and you have an open uh, um, an assistant on your clinic's homepage. Uh, you probably want to uh, teach the AI about your opening hours in the system prompt um, so that in case any end user asks what the opening hours are and what the address is and so on, it can respond with that information. So that would all go here in the system prompt. To make it more dynamic and versatile, we also support substitution strings in here. Uh, one last note about the system prompt. It is a very sensitive piece of information. So it's not, you don't see it here in the UI. Um, I promise you it's not in hidden away somewhere that the uh, end user can see. It really is only available to the Apex backend and the AI service. The end user will not have access to that uh, information. Okay, let's get rid of this. Uh, up next, we have a welcome message. So it, it's probably good to populate this with something like, um, what may I do for you? And that will appear as a first message sent by the AI. Uh, it's a bit of a dummy message. We don't uh, send this, um, this message to the AI service. It's only here to kind of direct the end user and to kind of guide them um, and give them some context about what the AI can do for them, what they can ask, and so on. So that is the welcome message. Uh, the default mode of this um, uh, experience is the di dialogue, um, which we do recommend uh, you use. And we can also set um, a more um, specific title. So assistant is a bit broad. Let's call it uh, your blogging expert and we should see that title change we should see that title change uh, but if you want to kind of embed uh, this chat in perhaps some other region on your page and you don't want to have this uh, this pop-up you can display it in line and you're gonna have to then provide some selector exactly where it is you want to embed that um, uh, that chat. And that is helpful for uh, longer lasting conversations, or maybe you want to pass information in, in and out, and you don't want to lose your context, right? Okay, what else do we have here? We have um, quick actions. So if your end user will always kind of start the conversation with the same task for the AI, it might be a good idea to uh, add them as quick actions. So these can be something like, tell me a joke. And we're going to see how that looks um, in the UI in a second. Or um, recommend um, a destination trip. A des travel, travel destination, something like that. OK, and that will look as such. So these quick actions end up being uh, little buttons so that the end user doesn't have to type the whole sentence. They can just click one of the quick actions, which will then become the message. Hmm, that's a funny joke. So those are the quick actions. OK, and of course, there's more. Um, there's more. Uh, bells and whistles uh, once you start playing around with it. But let's actually uh, make it do something useful because we're running out of time here. So I'm, ri I'm writing this blog post and I've, uh, I didn't actually write this by the way, but let's say I did and I worked a lot of hours on it and it's really good, but I still have to come up with a list of tags for this blog post. And I'm not, I'm not very good at it, right? Um, so that would be a perfect task for an AI to based on some um, content, come up with a list of tags um, on its own. 
So how do we do this? Well, first, the AI should have knowledge of the contents of my blog post. So um, if we go down here to initial prompt, we can give it some payload or some piece of data that, um, that it should know about to help us out with. Uh, and I'm going to just tell it, hey, take the contents of this page item and start the conversation with that. So there it is. And now I can ask it based on this content to, can you summarize this in two sentences, please? That's perfect. So it's not a real message, it's more of a context uh, message. But still, it's a bit ugly because I, I don't want to send the whole thing, right? So what we do here, we can provide, we can keep this sort of as a return uh, value, but we can also provide a display value. And in my case, I have another page item that stores um, a smaller uh, version of that uh, content. I think it's P3 content short. So if we open this, this is the context, it's a bit shorter, but behind the scenes, we are actually sending all of that content. Okay, so what did we wanna do? We wanted to um, tell it to come up with a list of tags for us. Sure, we can write it in here, right? Give me these tags, format them like so and so on, but really that is the, the system prompt is the perfect place to put this. So you are, an expert at blogging and coming up with tags based on the contents of a blog post. Make the tags SEO um, appropriate and keep them short. Something like this. And then I could say, please generate. Okay, so these are my tags here, but I'm still a long way from having them get populated in the tags page item. Um, hmm, I'm not happy with this, so let me keep um, refining this. Um, keep them one, keep them single words, uh, lowercase, um, uh, separate them. Uh, with a colon, like so. Um, no other information, just the tags. So I'm refining my system prompt here. Um, but I also, I don't want to say, please generate every time. It should just do the thing that I want it to do. And that's where the immediate action prompt um, can come in handy. So I can say, please generate the tags for the following content. And when we put all of this together, it will immediately say, please generate the tags for the following content. It will pass the content and the AI will respond. Now, I could take this content, copy it and paste it in here, but that is um, too much work. So let's see how we can automatically populate something, some response from the AI into let's say a page item. Use response um, section here. And I can say, hey, populate me the response into some page item. What is it? Tags. Um, and you will notice that how it works, it still gives us a chance to accept the response or not via a little button under the response from the AI. And I can give that button a label. Uh, let's go with use these tags. Okay, let's do this again. We open it up. It's thinking, has a list of tags. I click the button. It populates that response into some page item and it closes the conversation. It's as simple as that. Whew. Okay. Now, that was cool and it's way more versatile than this, uh, but um, I think for a quick demo, that's fine. However, we're really now 
I have to click three buttons, right? Uh, because I'm probably happy with, uh, uh, with the response. It would be cool if it worked even faster, even without any, any user input. Uh, let's see how we can do that. Well, for that, we can step away from the uh, chat-like experience. In order to do this, uh, we can see here the new package in the uh, API documentation. And the two most important functions are generate and chat. Generate is just a uh, shorter version of the chat function. And we can see that the chat function takes uh, the same types of parameters we already used here. So it takes a, a, a system prompt, um, a prompt, so the final or more most recent message, um, and uh, an array of messages uh, that represent the history of the chat. So we should be able to perform exactly this action with a bit of code um, instead. So let's go ahead and replace this dynamic action with an execute server side code dynamic action. Let's say that we want to submit the content and we want to get back the tags. And for the code itself, I already have it ready right here. And it's actually very simple. Um, we have the apexai.chat call uh, where we pass the system prompt. Uh, we also pass this array of, uh, of messages. Uh, in my case, the first message is just uh, the blog post itself. And the final prompt is um, go ahead and generate these tags for me. And we store then the uh, response from the AI service into the P3 tags page item. So now clicking this button should just automatically generate the tags for us without having to go and actually chat uh, with the AI. So uh, do check out the Apex AI package. Uh, one thing to mention about these, um, these procedures and functions is that they require an Apex session. So they will work just fine as part of your application, but if you want to run them in, say, SQL Developer, uh, you will need to wrap that call in a in an um, Apex session dot create, and then to drop uh, the session once you're done with it. And that's really all. So, I I will um, pass it back to Ralph for some closing statements. Thank you. Thanks, Stefan. That's very impressive, and uh, many many questions uh, on the on the Q and A. Wow. So uh, yeah, let me uh, quickly wrap that up. Uh, you saw a lot of uh, stuff demoed by uh, Christina and uh, Stefan, and you can imagine uh, this is our first release where we you know added uh, generative AI capabilities. We have many other things on the roadmap to come. So certainly one of uh, one of the first and important items is the support for OCI generative AI service chat models. So by the time when we wrapped up uh, Apex 24.1, that operation was not yet available on OCI generative AI. It has become available um, some sometime like 10 days ago. So uh, we we are going to to add this um, to um, you know to to Apex so that you can use OCI generative AI also in up for up builder use cases. Uh, then there are uh, more um, AI services coming from the OCI AI team. Uh, one of the next uh, services uh, that is uh, at the moment in beta that we are looking into is the Generative AI Agent Service. And the Agent Service, uh, they um, the OCI team implements a couple of uh, use cases like text to SQL, for example, or you know using Open Search as as a rack. Um, uh, long term, they will allow customers to build their own uh, agents, kind of a thing. So we are looking into integrating with with this. And then, of course, uh, you know what you've seen today uh, in in the app builder. That is also not the end. So we are looking into supporting more uh, use cases in application builder itself, like you know uh, using generative AI for application search, 
in the uh, text uh, editor and um, other use cases. Um, another another item uh, is of course generative AI for Apex uh, plugins. Uh, we want to use it there. Uh, and we are looking and working to, uh, together with the 23 AI team uh, on the vector search and rack and how to combine generative AI and the vector search and rack uh, in uh, 23 AI. And last not least, we ask you guys to uh, you know share your ideas at uh, apex.oracle.com slash ideas. We are curious on you know where you want to use uh, generative AI in your application. So please go there and share your ideas. And with that, you're already a bit over time. Um, yeah, uh, we'll wrap it up. And uh, thanks for joining the um, uh, office hour today. I give it over to Mark. All right, thank you, Ralph. And thank you, uh, Christina and Stefan, for your demos. That was great. Uh, there's a lot of questions uh, in, in Slack. Uh, we are all of time, so I'm not going to go through all of them. I do want to just briefly point you to that uh, blog post. I think that came up a few times. Uh, how do you configure this? Uh, this blog post talks about where you need to go. Uh, it's not there out of the box. If you go to apexorg.com or apexorg.com or uh, your cloud instance, it's not right there uh, enabled out of the box. You need to uh, configure it. So take a look at that uh, blog post. I'll put it here into uh, chat. Uh, but yeah, that should uh, get you going. Uh, we will make the recording available afterwards uh, so you can watch all the demos again. Uh, all the Q&A are going to be available there as well so you can read through that. And if any questions went unanswered, uh, we're going to meet again in a week uh, for uh, part two of the Apex Office Hour. So you're welcome to bring your questions there and uh, uh, you can talk more about that then. And uh, with that, I would like to thank you all very much for attending today and uh, please come back. Uh, there are three more uh, parts to go. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye.